Welcome everybody. Welcome to our webinar today on getting started in EcoChurch. So we've got the three different EcoChurch webinars and this is the first one for you if you're if you're at the beginning of that journey, if you're thinking what is EcoChurch, how do I get started, what I do, what do I do first, you're in the right place. Uh, very quick housekeeping, we will be using the Q&A function for questions rather than the chat. So if you move your mouse around and find the Q&A and then you can click in there, you can write your questions. You'll also be able to see other people's questions and you can click a thumbs up next to a question that's of interest to you. The questions that have the most thumbs up will rise to the top. And uh, when Helen has finished speaking, the remaining time that we have left, I'll start with the questions at the top of the list and start working my way down. Um, after today, I'll send everyone who's registered a copy of the slides and any links that go in the chat and um, ask you for some feedback on the webinars as well. And I record the webinars and we share them through our website. So please do take notes, but be confident that the slides will be coming your way and that in a few days time, the recording will be able to be watched again through our website. I always begin by giving you little trailers for upcoming attractions. We've got the three Eco Church webinars you'll hear at the first one on getting started. We've got two more working towards an award and maintaining and maintaining momentum and then working towards net zero carbon. And then in the middle of July, we've got uh, switching to a more technical subject. We've got a webinar on the basics of heat pumps. And looking ahead to September, we've got a pair of webinars on environmental fundraising. The first on what opportunities there are out there and the second on how to go about doing the fundraising. But coming back to today, uh, if you've been to one of my sessions before, I'm Catherine Ross. I'm a member of the Church of England's Environment Programme staff and I'm based in the Cathedral and Church Buildings Division. But more importantly, we've got Helen Stevens, who is uh, the person who, who is, is behind the Eco Church program, uh, who has supported hundreds of churches in their Eco Church journey. She's a church, church relations manager at Arosha UK. And I will stop sharing my slides and hand over to Helen, who will take you through how to get started in Eco Church. Helen, take it away. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, it's lovely to be with you all today. There we go. <laughs> um, so thank you for taking the time to come to the webinar um, this afternoon. We have got uh, just about an hour together today, uh, and this is what I'm hoping to cover, which I hope is not too much of a surprise or something different from what you might have been expecting. Just some brief context setting, um, why we need the church to respond to the environmental crises that we're facing today and some of the barriers that we might face. Some case studies of how a few churches that I know of have got started um, in some very different ways. A very quick overview of the Eco Church app. I'm not going to go into it in lots of detail today. I want to show you just a little bit about some of the functionality. Where to find additional help? Uh, what next? I'm not proposing that we do a 30, 60, 90 day plan, but just to get you thinking about how you might plan going forward from here. And then some time for Q&A, I hope, in about 15, 20 minutes at the end. First off, um, if Catherine could please um, load up the poll, I'd just like to know how familiar you are with EcoChurch. Um, I recognise a few names from the chat um, and it's great to see you all, great to see people from around the country, but it's always good to just have a bit of a sense of how familiar people are. So you, you really don't know much about it yet, you know a little, you've registered but maybe haven't started the survey or actually you're registered and you're actively working towards bronze, in which case I might be calling upon you in the Q&A. So if you could just take some, uh, a few seconds to vote. Thank <laughs> you. 
Catherine, are you, are we almost there? Oh, we're almost there. So nearly everyone has voted. Should you want me okay. to click share the results? Yes, please. Lovely. I'll just end polling and then if I hit share the results, it should come up on screen. Great. Thank you. Okay, so about a quarter of you have registered already. You're actively working towards bronze. That's really encouraging. Um, most of you, almost half, you've not yet registered or started the survey. Okay, I'm hoping that um, by the end of today, you'll be doing both of those. Um, and for those of you uh, that haven't yet started the survey, that you'll be doing that. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. And then the next poll, if we could just ask you to do one more, please. Thanks, Catherine. Some of the barriers to getting started or indeed keeping going. Maybe a lack of knowing about Eco Church or knowing where to start. Maybe not enough support from others. Maybe other priorities of people not seeing it as part of our mission and worries about cost. Worth knowing with this one that it, certainly on my screen, a couple of the options you have to scroll down to see. So it's worth checking them all before you click on the click to submit your vote. Thanks, Catherine. That's 40 people voted so far. It's slowing down. F 53 people have, have voted. It's a bit like waiting for the results of the Eurovision. <laughs> not that I've watched that in recent years. <laughs> Luckily, you're not getting nil point. No, I well, hope not. <laughs> Right, shall I just give it a few more seconds and then I'll oh, sure. bowling. It's very mixed, isn't it? Oh, you probably can't see the results. I can't see it at the moment, right. but okay, okay. Right. My screen coming in live. Right, I'll click end polling there and I will share the results. Oh, very interesting. Okay, thanks, Catherine. Thanks all of you for voting. So I would say we've got a chunk of people not knowing what to do first, okay? Um, needing a group to work with is also quite high, 38%. Um, <clears throat> lack of time and other priorities, 38% again. Um, not seen as part of mission is just 13%. That's really encouraging actually. And not knowing enough about it yet. Okay, yeah, about 13%. So mixture of things we will I will do my best to uh, go through some of these um, today my slide seems to have got stuck there we go so just some very brief context I think the fact that uh, you've come to this webinar today um, I'm sure all of you realize that the time we're in uh, is very serious uh, from an environmental perspective. We're, way, we're facing um, dual crises uh, from climate change. And in 2018, the International Governmental Panel on Climate Change um, reported that we had just 12 years in which to keep uh, global warming within one and a half degrees um, of pre-industrial levels. And we've already used up um, three years of those and you may know from the recent G7 that uh, we didn't get enough commitment from the government. There was much, actually much more talk around um, the, the foreign uh, aid budget, which seemed to be a distraction and the government weren't expecting that to play such a significant part in the discussions. But we've got COP26 on the horizon, which I will say a bit more about today. We've also got um, the challenge of biodiversity loss. Um, related to climate change very much, but we are um, losing species across the globe at a very rapid rate. We know all of this because we're seeing these sorts of reports and these headlines in our newspapers, 
because of the likes of David Attenborough and his, um, I was going to say Blue Planet, that's a bit older, but so many recent series on um, planet Earth, um, years of reporting from him, and in fact from him a direct call to the G7 to take action. But it can feel overwhelming. Um, I think some of you have replied to that, uh, not knowing where to start and um, not having enough time perhaps. So what I'd like to suggest is about finding common ground and coming back to our Christian faith and our context. Um, the Pope, Pope Francis in his encyclical Laudato Si published in 2015 um, talked about planet Earth as our common home. He's, and this verse from Genesis, uh, not Pope Francis, he saw all that he had made and it was very good. God loves this earth and he wants us to delight in it too. And it's clear from the preceding slides um, that we've not, not been doing um, a great job of that. We've been doing far more uh, working the land, if you like, rather than caring for it. Um, and it impacts, as we know, on our neighbours, both locally and globally, and on species around the world, with a million facing extinction in the coming decades. But when we start talking to people about these issues, um, and it all feels overwhelming, maybe we can come back to, to this, to finding common ground, to um, realising that actually we all uh, love nature and need it, depend on it um, for so many of our, <clears throat> excuse me, our life sources, the water cycle, uh, the food cycle, wh whatever it might be, we are intrinsically um, connected to the earth and dependent on it. The pandemic, I'd like to suggest, has given us um, a real opportunity to have conversations about this because there have been so many reports over the last few months about people rediscovering nature. Um, I remember David Attenborough once being asked about this when he uh, discovered his passion for nature and uh, he said he'd never really lost it, he'd had it since a boy right into adulthood, but many of us forget um, those early connections that we have. People have reported being able to enjoy birdsong much more. The birdsong was there all along, but when the planes were switched off and the traffic noise ceased uh, and we stopped being so busy, we've had a chance to get out and to experience what's on our doorsteps. So rediscovering nature is something hopefully that we can continue to do together. Um, we've had lovely opportunities, opportunities over the last months perhaps to go for a walk with one friend <laughs> Now, gradually, as things are opening up, we can do more of that together. So maybe in our churches, before we even start thinking about eco church or a survey, we can just get out and enjoy nature and fall in love with what's on our doorsteps. The second aspect is about um, maybe finding as well as retaining a future hope. We know that God loves this earth and that he's promised that it has a future and a hope. Um, the um, verse in, in the Bible, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay. And we know that Jesus' resurrection was not just for us, but for all living things in Colossians 1.15. And so we can have a future hope, even if sometimes uh, it can be hard to find that in our kind of proximate day to day. Um, but it's about holding that hope and trying to help others to find hope in the action that we can take together. Caring for and connecting with our neighbours, um, a third aspect of, eco, of caring for the earth, the third thing that can bring us together. Just a few weeks back, um, I was at St Richard's in Ham and um, happened to come across these two gentlemen who'd recently started doing eco church um, with their church. They were putting up bird boxes on the day as well as um, trying to repair a window uh, oh, sorry, measuring up a window to be repaired after some vandalism. And they were also keen to show off this um, rather palatial, beautiful bug hotel that they um, had on their grounds. Um, it's on the outskirts of Richmond, um, in itself a, a very wealthy part of London, but this particular estate is by no means wealthy. Um, like I said, they get vandalism and all sorts of things. One of these gentlemen in particular had only started coming to church in recent years and he just discovered a real uh, connection with the community and uh, had become a sort of self-appointed caretaker of 
um, the ground, the land around the church. And just recently, a chance conversation with a passerby, um, he turned out to be a Kew botanist. And they then got, got involved um, with something that's been a recent pilot for us called Churches Count on Nature. And they um, surveyed all of the species uh, right there on their church doorstep, so to speak. And they found at least 90 different plants, including a rare bee orchid. So caring for the earth, enjoying the earth is a way for us um, both to care for and connect with our neighbours. And then taking action for future generations. A report that was out a few months ago um, from Tear Fund and Youthscape um, had this as the heading, young people call on the church to tackle the climate crisis. Nine out of 10 Christian um, teenagers surveyed were really concerned about climate change and just one in 10 thought the church was doing enough. So for those people in your church who perhaps don't see this as mission, think there are other priorities um, that are maybe lacking somehow the motivation to get started, um, perhaps highlight some of these um, messages that young people really care about this. We all need nature. It is part of our Christian mission and the earth does have a hope and a future. There's just some stats from that, um, from that report and you can download the whole report from Tear Fund's website um, and there's a lot in there. I think this last one, particularly for people that might be struggling to engage church leaders, uh, well, young people, if they're, not, if they're perhaps not willing to, to listen to us as uh, middle-aged or older people, perhaps they would listen to the younger generation, but this really matters to them. And we know in many of our churches that we want to see more children and young people growing up um, to know and love God and um, to be part of our, our church community. So perhaps you can share some of that with them. So Eco Church then is a framework for action to demonstrate to our neighbours, um, to ourselves in our ch as church communities, that the gospel is good news for God's earth. It was launched in January 2016, um, so we celebrated our fifth anniversary. Um, we had an online service in March, um, and in over that time, we have grown to be a community of 3,700 plus registered churches. Um, and we've given out about, about 1,100 awards um, over that time, with the latest going to Salisbury Cathedral just last week. So huge congratulations to them. But it's very much an ecumenical scheme. It is, um, I, I suspect, I don't know, many of you might be from Anglican churches today, but it, we have Methodist, United Reform, Church in Wales, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, um, a host of churches across England and Wales. It doesn't run in Scotland or Northern Ireland for the simple fact that Eco Congregation, which was a forerunner to Eco Church, um, is still running um, in those parts of the country and doing well there, but we very much work with them. Um, and similarly with the Catholic Church, you have their own scheme called Live Simply. Um, just to say that it is um, an award scheme, many of you will know that already. Um, not because the awards are um, an end in themselves, but it's important when faced with such huge challenges to stop along the way and celebrate um, the things that we can do, the steps that we can take as we move hopefully through those awards from bronze to silver and gold. There are also resources um, and web, um, conferences or webinars like this one um, when ordinarily if we could meet face to face, we'd be able to share and meet each other um, and share ideas. Just want to, um, over the next few minutes, uh, tell you about a couple of churches across the country and how in particular they got started. St Leonard's in Dinnington is a church that I came across um, just a month or two back uh, when I had the chance to interview the lady who runs their Eco Church group um, ahead of a, a conference that we were doing in Sheffield. It's a church that uh, recently celebrated um, 150 years. So it's been around for a long time, as you'll see from some of these um, old photographs. When I was looking at their website to try to get a bit more insight into who they were, um, I found a parish magazine from uh, the, what was it, 1978, I think. And uh, the whole magazine had been reproduced 
And I just found myself reading that and really getting a sense of who this church is. Um, like I say, it's, you know, they've, they've been around for a long time. But in 1978, they were fundraising for Christian Aid. They just bought a plot of land next to the church, which today is part of the land that they look after through Eco Church. Um, they had uh, poetic reflections in there. They talked about welcoming ramblers. Um, and it, it, it was clear from this old parish magazine that it, it was a church, is a church that cares about social justice. Now, there wasn't anything particularly in there about climate justice or environmental justice, um, but to an extent, the environment wasn't being talked about um, in quite the same way uh, 35, 40 years ago. But the fact is that at their core, they're a church that cares about justice. It's sort of in their DNA. And so I'm mentioning this because for many of us, what, who we already are as church, the things we care about, can act as a really strong foundation from which to build and go forward. They got started in 2016. They took um, a few years to get their bronze award, but they've been doing all the small steps. Um, they started with things like putting up um, uh, bird boxes, um, looking at what they had on their land. Um, and they now um, have a monthly newsletter in which they share eco tips. Um, they have a team, a Nikki, they are eco team leader was very keen to point out um, about not trying to do this on our own and we can we can come on to a little bit of that in a minute about how we might build a team around us um, they've got their bronze now and they're working um, working towards silver they're an eco team of about six people but a very you know a relatively small congregation of 50 or 60 and the other message from them was to be realistic about what we can do um, and how even the small steps when we combine those collectively um, actually really matter. The second church I want to highlight um, took quite a different approach. Again, um, an old historic church, St Andrew's Church in Rugby. Um, they, uh, I don't know, perhaps didn't have that social uh, justice in their church DNA, if you like. I remember talking um, to the then vicar who said that they didn't seem to have anything that brought them together as a church. Well, before they got into Eco Church, they did a parish pilgrimage to Assisi um, to reflect on um, the life and, and the inspiration of St. Francis. When they came back from that, they then, um, they had some funding, but they did a community art project to engage people through art with the natural world. And I don't know if it's still there, but at the back of their church, they had a beautiful mosaic um, of pieces of artwork that were done by people in the community. And it's just so joyful and vibrant. And it's almost like their homage, if you like, to um, the natural world and to what they had learned together. So their starting point was engaging from a point of reflection and beauty. Um, actually, we tried something similar in my own church of all souls um, four or five years back, um, again before Eco Church. Um, but we uh, held a photography exhibition and over the course of a few weeks, we encouraged people to take photographs of what was on their doorstep, what they noticed and what they loved from the natural world. And then we had those photos on display uh, in the church over the course of a weekend. And we got local school children to contribute to. Um, so they'd drawn pictures of, of, of some of the things that they love. So art can often be a great way in or doing something together, gosh, it doesn't have to be a pilgrimage to Assisi, but it could be setting aside a day to go out and walk in your local community and see what's around you and reflect on nature and beauty and come back together and then start a conversation about what are some of the things, some of the actions that you can take where you are. St Andrews went on to get their gold award in 2018. Um, they actually sort of flew through the awards, um, which is not necessarily <laughs> what I would recommend. I think there is something about stopping and celebrating each stage, but they were so passionate and enthusiastic. One of the things they really uh, took on board was twinning, not just their own toilets, but all of the toilets, um, sort of public toilets across rugby and uh, schools and their MPs building as well. Um, that comes under the community and global engagement section of Eco Church. Um, but they've also, they also act very much as a beacon. It's almost as though they've taken down their church walls and invited the rest of the town in. And it does happen to be a town that's um, 
got a lot going on. Um, they've got practical action and environmental development charity based there, but they now hold things like we're holding sustainable Saturdays. They have um, a guard, uh, garden space that's partly managed by the council, but they've gone into partnership with them. So from that creative um, pilgrimage start, um, they've gone on to, to lots of actions. And then the third one I wanted to highlight is how we can perhaps come together around a defining moment. And this year at Bramall Methodist Church, um, a church in Cheshire, they are really going for it ahead of COP26. So COP26, Conference of the Parties, uh, sort of funny uh, language around this, we'll meet in Glasgow for two weeks um, in, the sec in November. Can't quite remember the dates, don't let me misquote those. And this year, many churches are getting uh, involved in Climate Sunday. Um, and Bramall, I think, I mean, they started sort of looking at this a few years ago through the passion of one person um, who wanted to try and get the environment onto the church's agenda, but then through an initiative with Hope for the Future and um, USPG this year, they've come together with 35 other churches um, in their area to really focus on the climate. So they've held a Climate Sunday service. Um, their commitment is to go forward with Eco Church and their call for action um, as the third part of Climate Sunday is to hopefully meet with their MP um, and to um, try to, uh, well, to, to raise climate change um, as an issue that's really important for them. Climate Sunday, if you haven't come across it, um, could be a great place to start with your church. Um, there's a lot of information on the Climate Sunday website. There are themed months um, up until September. Um, there's one coming up soon on climate change and pastoral care, um, which we have been curating resources for at the Roche UK. But it's about um, holding a service, um, a Climate Sunday service, making a commitment, which could be, as I say, registering for Eco Church, committing to the next level of the Eco Church Award, and then speaking up by maybe arranging to see your MP in person or to sign um, the Climate Coalition's The Time Is Now declaration, calling on the government for deeper action. Coming back to Eco Church itself then, so after all the sort of scene setting and, and trying to um, find inspiration and have conversations with people, um, then is the point perhaps to come to the app itself. This is our website address. And if you go onto that, you will find a place where you can register um, or log in to the Eco Church app. I've got some screenshots here that I've pulled off my own account. So, that's the first um, page that you will see. So you log in yourself um, and then you can um, put in your own profile details um, and start working through the survey. So on the user profile, for example, I've got two churches that I'm a, mem that I'm a member of, my own uh, church in St. Margaret's um, and a, a, a church that we use uh, as a test account. There are communications preferences in here, so um, I'd really encourage you to sign up to Eco Church Connect. It's our bi-monthly newsletter um, in which we share, if you like, community news about what's going on across the wider Eco Church community, um, but as well as uh, events that are coming up, um, campaigns that maybe some of our partners are running, like Christian Aid or Tear Fund. Um, so it's a great way of keeping in touch and feeling connected to a bigger community. Once you've registered uh, yourself, you then go and join or register a church. Um, so I've just put St Stephen's Church in Twickenham here. It's a church I know that's fairly local. It will then bring up a list of churches, um, many of which might be registered eco churches already. Um, anyway, you click the one that is your church. You might find that somebody else has gone on there and registered your church um, without you knowing, which sometimes happens. Um, and then you can join your church and um, you can invite others to become part of your church team. So it's not one login per church anymore as it, as it was a few years back. Uh, you can invite others to collaborate with you on the survey. And then you can start a survey. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the, the screenshots or details of this today, but you can save your survey. Um, it's not time bound, uh, you can take as long as you like to work through 
uh, the different categories, which I will talk briefly about um, in a moment. And then actually the survey itself will prompt you when you have done enough to apply for a bronze or a silver or a gold award. You have to get uh, an equal amount of points in each of the five main categories of Eco Church to get to a bronze award and the same for silver and gold. Um, and that's because the categories uh, which we'll come on to um, are very much about um, embedding uh, caring for the earth in, in the, the key aspects of our church life together. So the eco church categories briefly um, are worship and teaching. I'll say a bit more about each of these in a minute. Buildings, land, community and global engagement, lifestyle. Um, and then in every section, there's always space to write additional comments. And we'd really encourage you to do that because um, we can't capture everything in a binary survey. Um, and there's always so much more that churches are doing. And we love to hear about that because um, it helps to sort of put some colour on your story, if you like, particularly by silver and gold levels. Um, it's just really helpful to know a bit more. If you put an explanation in, for example, as to why maybe you've put not applicable against something. Worship and teaching um, is, is always the place to start and the foundation. I think for some of the reasons that I touched on earlier, um, we know we have um, a God who loves the earth that he has made and who calls us to care for and look after it. So this section is about whether we're um, sharing from the front um, about what the Bible says about creation, praying for environmental issues, praying ahead of COP26, um, teaching our, our children and young people if we have them in um, groups, um, encouraging them to teach us as is so often the case. Um, so it's very foundational. Um, also um, about the songs and liturgy that we're using, and there are um, environmental, in, environmentally inspired, creation inspired um, forms of songs um, and liturgy and so on, which you can find on our website. Buildings is the second category, often the one that people find really challenging. Um, many of the webinars that Catherine and Joe have been putting on through the Church of England are really helpful as far as this category, because um, this is about the practical um, challenges that we often face to heat and light our churches, uh, which, as we know, beautiful uh, as many of our buildings are, can be really expensive to do. Um, but it is possible, having met with Salisbury last week, I mean, they're an 800-year-old building, um, but they are now changing out all of their lighting to LEDs. They've made huge progress. Um, they have eventually got faculty permission um, to have some solar panels on their roof. But they were also keen to point out that, um, you know, as mundane as it might sound, they've actually worked really hard to draft proof their building. So it's always worth starting with um, perhaps, the, as, as they said, the, the least inspiring options, but the ones that really matter. Um, so look around your building and see what you can do and also how the space is being used. This is a photograph of Christ Church in Toxteth Park in Liverpool, um, another gold award winning church. Um, but they came up with a creative solution of holding, instead of lighting and heating the whole church on a Sunday, of holding their service uh, within a marquee within the church. So holding that bigger space but creating um, a more environmentally friendly option within that space. Um, and I think they have a separate marquee for their children's work. Um, and then, yeah, also on buildings, something that, that we can all do is switch our energy provider to a renewable energy um, supplier. Um, and I think parish buying has some, um, some options um, for churches there as well. The third category is land. And sorry, I should just say, um, if you don't own your church building or feel that you have enough influence over it to make a difference, you can um, leave out that section or, or put not applicable for some of those sections where you might be in a grade one listed building and, and it's just not cost effective for you to make some of those changes. We would always encourage you to do what you can, but this is not about penalising you for what you can't do. And the same applies to land. Um, although I have to say that over the last few years, since allowing this section to be um, 
optional if churches don't think they've got very much land. Um, I think we're encouraging churches more and more to use even small spaces of land that you might have. Um, so St James's Piccadilly, for example, where these photographs have been taken from, um, is an inner, um, a, a church in the middle of London, got relatively small area of land, um, but they have been using it, uh, managing it over the last few years to care for nature. So they've planted for pollinators, they're on the B line um, to promote um, pollinators, to, to promote bees sort of having a path through London. Um, they've created a bog garden just from some buckets. Last year they had um, a project growing wheat in the forecourt um, just to really try and explore their connection to the land and to our farming land, um, feeling so far removed from it in the middle of the city. And there are also church demo days that we do. We've got one um, coming up in Fox Earth um, next month and in Wolffields, which is our urban reserve in Southall, um, as a way of trying to demonstrate what's possible, even on small amounts of land. And the recent Churches Count on Nature, which I mentioned earlier and which some of you may be aware of, um, a recent pilot between the Church of England, uh, Church in Wales and Caring for God's Acre, was a great opportunity for people to get out and look at what's on their land. Um, and um, survey it to do a bit of citizen science. Community and global engagement is the fourth section. Um, it's often the poorest and the most vulnerable in our society and across the world who are the most impacted by climate change. Um, the temperature changes that we're talking about, the one and a half degrees, um, that could be so much more in some parts of the earth. Um, this photo is in Turkana in northern Kenya, um, already of well, when I had the fortune to live there 20 plus years ago, it was all very, already a very, very hot place to live. Um, parts of the globe are going to become inhospitable over the coming years. So we need to do what we can and to be campaigning um, in this section through working with others uh, locally, nationally and globally. So something like um, taking a Climate Sunday action for COP26 would fit in here. Um, as would partnering with other organisations. So one of the things that Salisbury Cathedral did um, was to get um, a complete um, ecology report done um, with an organisation called Plant Life, who happen to be based in Salisbury. There are all sorts of connections that we can be making. Lifestyle is the fifth category, um, all about what we can be doing in our own homes and lives to take action for the environment. And from a church perspective, encouraging each other to do this through our Monday um, to, to Sunday lives. Um, so things like uh, looking at how we bank, where our pensions are invested, um, looking at moving our own uh, energy suppliers at home to renewable sources. Um, so there's a lot in this section too, as well as maybe undertaking a lifestyle survey together. Uh, once you've gone through all of the survey and got your uh, relevant points in each of the categories, you, you can, and I said earlier, the survey will prompt you to apply for an award. Um, you can also choose to buy a plaque made by a lovely social enterprise in Glasgow. Further sources of information and help, just to say to you that there is um, a set of resources on our website. Uh, we've been working to update them over the last four to six months and are really hoping that um, during July we will start to get some refreshed material up on there. The Church of England environment pages um, are so uh, helpful, there's lots on there. The webinar programme that we've mentioned um, that Catherine and Joe have been running, but also uh, conferences throughout the year. Um, that we do um, and often in partnership. So there's been a whole series run by um, a number of the dioceses over the last um, 10 months or so. And although we've not been able to meet face to face, there've been um, great days of uh, sharing stories and hearing from each other and trying to encourage each other. And I think when you are getting started with Eco Church, um, it's finding people who can support you, ideally um, in your own church, but also I think you can look a little bit further afield and maybe on the Eco Church map, see if there are churches in your area that are already doing this and reach out to them um, to see if they, they are willing to, um, to give you help. And so often churches are willing to share their stories. Um, there's also, for example, the Diocesan Environmental Officer Network for Anglican churches. 
think there are other networks in some of the other denominations with people who um, are there to try and uh, point you to other people who can help. Two more things to mention. We've got a frequently asked section on our own website. Um, so please do go on there if you've not yet started to use the app and if you get into any um, challenges of that, there's a lot of information. There's also forms on there that you can contact us um, if you need um, a bit of help or have a question to ask. And then more recently, we've set up um, two advisor networks. One is a naturalist advisor network. So for people wanting help um, with land in particular, you can get in touch and ask a question. And we've got um, some naturalist volunteers who will be really pleased to try to help. And the same with buildings. We know that that's another section um, that's really challenging. And so we also are building up a team of advisors um, to help on that too. The final thing I want to say really is about having courage to get started. Um, I think it's something that we will uh, all need Pope Francis talked about how we all need um, an ecological conversion of our hearts. Um, we know that we uh, live in very challenging times, but we know too that we can find, um, we can have both a future hope and that we can find current hope in seeing uh, the many, many multiplying actions that are going on um, in our own country and around the world. It can seem daunting and overwhelming but getting started can often give us uh, the motivation to take the next step. I just started reading this morning um, a little bit, a little book. It's been on my son's bookshelf for quite some time, but it's how to be a two minute superhero. Kids fight plastic. And the lovely thing about this approach is that it's broken down into bite sized chunks. And it's all about um, how we can make a difference, even in two minutes. Um, and this chap started the two minute beach cleanup um, about seven, eight years ago because he was so horrified um, by the amount of plastic washing up on our shores. Um, and from just taking one step, we can take the next step and build from there. And that is it. Sorry, I couldn't remember if I had another slide, but no. Um, I'm going to stop there uh, and give us just a little bit of time that we've got left for some questions. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Helen. I'm sure people have found that very useful thinking of those uh, thinking of those barriers that they mentioned at the beginning, particularly I think you told them what to what to do first, where to get started. Um, so looking at the questions. So if you've got a question, you want to find the Q&A, pop it in there. You can also see other people's questions and do the thumbs up next to them. And we're just going to start at the top and, and see how we go. Uh, and we've got a mixture on there at the moment, Helen, of, of practical questions and slightly more kind of searching philosophical questions almost. So let's start with some of the practical ones because that's what's at the top um, from Alison. My role is to encourage churches in our diocese to take part and to help them along the way. Can she use the app? So if you've got a role where you're working with a number of churches, uh, can, can somebody like that register and see the app rather than linking it to one specific church? Yes, that's a good question. Um, you can do that. So um, yeah, sorry, I've closed my slides now, but I've got two churches on my profile, but I can actually go in and add another church. I wouldn't recommend that for the majority of people, but for people who have a role where you want to see multiple churches or support multiple churches, yes, you can join multiple churches. So just so she could join and, and, and sort of add every church that's in her diocese, or is there a way that she can join as a diocesan person, join yeah. the app rather than... Uh, oh, just, just, just as a, a person rather than, I mean, if she doesn't want to register, if she, if you don't want to register your own church, uh, yes, you can just have a profile on there, but you have to join a church to see the detail of that church, unless you want to look at the map view, which will just give you that high level view of which churches are registered, if that makes sense. So, so she could either join and have that kind of high level view or she could join and, and link herself to each of the churches in the diocese and have them all on her sort of profile. Yes, I, I would advise letting them know <laughs> that that's what you're going to do. Uh, and also just being really sure if your own church is registered that you're in the right church profile <laughs> before you make any changes. That's one of the challenges of it being an open, um, open access app. The next question is 
from Elizabeth who says, I'm in a parish of five churches with very different communities. We have a newly formed enthusiastic environment working subgroup of the parochial church council. Are we able to register as a parish or will it need to be as five separate churches? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we've been asked a lot over the years about how to register benefices or yeah, where there's a kind of multi-church site ministry. Um, if I kind of deal with the, yeah, <laughs> I think the first thing to say is if you have a worshipping community that's uh, an entity in its own right um, that, uh, that maybe moves between multiple buildings, that's fine. You can register as one community, as one church community. If across those buildings there are different worshipping communities, we'd encourage you to separately register each of those um, and to get on and you know make make progress in each of those churches. I, I think um, where there are church built, you know, multiple buildings that a church is using, um, the the practical limitation at the moment is the app is not set up to give you the option to have one registration and then to kind of do multiple buildings in that survey. I think the best thing at the moment is to get in touch with us and we'll try and go into a bit more detail about ways around that. So we know it's something we need to look at. Okay. Uh, the next question is about church schools. Can church schools join Eco Church directly or is it best via their mother church? Um, church schools. So we're, we're getting more questions all the time about schools. I think there are some wonderful connections that could be made here. Um, and Catherine, you may have some insight on this as well. There is something called eco schools. So the first answer is that we'd encourage schools to go and do eco school. But we are increasingly aware of overlaps or synergies, if you like, especially where it's a church school and the church in the area is trying to do eco church. There's no kind of formula um, or set answer on this at the moment, except go and have conversations, see if the children from the school can come in and help you with the Eco Church survey and maybe vice versa. I think lots of potential for joint action here, um, not something we've formalised. I'll put the Eco Schools link in the. Thanks, Catherine. So. So the next question, this is the one that I was thinking was a slightly more searching kind of philosophical question. So this is from Tim. Says, the simplicity of eco church seems to encourage a tick box mentality, searching for easy points that will take the church across the next threshold. Have you any thoughts on how to keep the focus on doing what is right and just? Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks for asking that, because I actually meant to say this earlier on and realised I'd forgotten to mention it. Um, you can do it as a tick box exercise. I think, you know, I remember having this concern myself in the early days when I came, when I first came across Eco Church. Um, I think it is possible. You could do it in that kind of reductionist way, if you like, you know, we're just going to do this. Actually, it's not, that's not really the ethos of it. Um, it is not an exhaustive list. There are always more things that we can do. So hence we get questions about, you know, why isn't this in Eco Church or why isn't that in Eco Church? And indeed we can look at, uh, bringing more into it, but it is there as a framework. It is about trying to encourage a change in the culture of our churches so that creation care becomes embedded in our church and is a fundamental part of our mission um, as Christians and to the wider world to care for this earth. So it is a framework, it's a, a set of tools through the resources and the survey, um, but really we'd encourage you to take an holistic approach um, we don't currently have anything beyond gold, but by the time a church gets to gold, they are really a beacon for environmental um, practice, championing it in their area. Um, that, that's the path that we'd love to see all churches taking. Uh, that helps a bit. Yeah, I think so. It's, it's that churches should do what's right and just, and then that can be celebrated by getting an award rather than working to get an award as quickly and easily as they can um, by doing the things which are picking the boxes. Absolutely, yeah. And by the time a church is getting to silver or gold, it, you know, certainly by gold, it's got to be more than a tick box exercise. Um, you know, we, I haven't said, 
I say maybe again in another session about the assessment, but it is really trying to understand that this is now part of the DNA of the church. And men, and the, the great gold churches will say, now this is the start of our journey. <laughs> it's not the end. Uh, okay, so the next question is a, a, a very simple and practical one. When you say app, is this the online website or is there a phone-based thing that they need to... <sighs> download yeah. and get on their smartphone yeah yeah no, okay so there's an eco church website which you can get to from the Arusha uk website from the eco church website itself though you can get to an app um it's not really uh designed for mobile phone use um we may get there but it's uh it's an application if you like that that uh, in which the survey uh the, the surveys and all the church data is housed um, so you need to set up a login and a password to get to that platform. So, so the answer to the question is it's not a smartphone app that you download from the Google Play Store. No, it's sorry, app, no, no. It's that page on your website that you, that you navigate to. Yeah. Lovely. Um, do you have any tips for talking about environmental issues and climate change to your wider church congregation? who may feel that the broad nature of eco-church is overwhelming to get them on board. So that's pointing to that barrier we had at the beginning, isn't it, about you know, finding a group to work with and, and getting other people in the community yeah. supported. Yeah, yeah. Um, a couple of things to come to mind on this one. One might be, I know a church that took the survey and I think went through it with the church congregation and they decided together what were the things in those categories that really mattered to them and that they wanted to do? So there was real collective ownership from the start um, and people started getting involved in, you know, in making their own um, bird boxes and so on. Um, they decided what, what was important to them. Um, and now I've lost my train of thought. I thought the other one was going to be, go out, go out for coffee. That was it. So <laughs> when, I, when I, I've been trying to find ways to... Um, care for the environment in my own church over the years, not, not always within Eco Church. Um, but when I was getting started with Eco Church, um, I did go out for coffee with a few people uh, that I either knew in the congregation were interested or other people had said, oh, I think this person works in this field, go and find out. And one chap I came across was absolutely passionate about the environment. He'd um, retrofitted his home and was living um, really in a very sustainable way, he doesn't have a car and so on, but he'd never connected that environmental passion with his faith, which I've also, you know, heard a lot over the years. Um, but trying to find a way for him to bring the two together, he then became really involved in our um, environmental group um, and really championing, helping to champion it to others. Um, so I think it's always worth trying to find out who people are in our church and what they care about, what their passions are, and finding that common ground um, to go forward together. And looking for the small steps, you know, it could start with a litter pick, it could start with a two minute beach cleanup. Um, it doesn't have to be the big stuff, it's taking the small steps and building on those. Uh, the next question is from Paula, who says, I have registered both churches and looked at the survey questions. There are two areas where we've not made any progress and answers would all be no. Is it premature to complete the survey then? Um, sorry, so the, the answers are all known, but they've it's, not made any progress. They've got sections of a survey where at the moment they're at no on everything. Right. Okay. Is it worth them doing the survey at the moment? And I think from what you said, you, you don't do it all in one go. You can keep coming back to it as you get things done. So it, presumably it is worth making a start on the survey and just saving wherever you're at now. And Exactly. And you can use it as a planning tool. So even if those things are no now, um, yeah, I mean, maybe decide from that, okay, well, let's have a go at these couple of things, the, the, the quick wins, if you like, and then do those come back to the survey a bit later on and you can put your answers in it's always I think worth doing it um, and seeing where you're at using it as a kind of benchmark in each area um, you know you, you that that's for your information only and then you can use it as a, as a planning tool and the final question that's on there is about is there any authorization process required 
for people who join a church. So I'd register my church. I assumed that if anyone else attempted to join, I would need to verify them. So the answer is not currently. It's something that we may uh, may get to look at, but 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 no, anybody can can join your church team. Um, there is a very verification process around the award submission itself. So we always need a church leader's sign off before um, an award can, can be applied for, that's part of the process. But there's no verification at the joining stage. Okay, so if I, I've gone on, I've registered my church and linked it to my profile, someone else in the church community goes on, they can see the church on there, they can then link to it. And as many people as want to can do that. Yes. But when it actually comes to saying, right, we think we're at bronze, then that yes. requires a church leader to say, yeah, we agree as a community that we're ready. Yes. All right. That's fine. Uh, right. I think that's landing fairly beautifully that we've answered all the questions on there. Okay. Coming up to, to toward two o'clock. Um, I might just ask you for a final thought, Helen, looking at the, the barrier that came highest in people's minds was about what to do first. If people are leaving this and thinking, right, I feel all fired up, what should they what should they do this afternoon? What do they do first in this journey? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question again, Catherine. You asked me this last week and I'm on the land webinar and I know thinking, do I I know what I said there, which was to get out and enjoy nature. And we do talk about that at Arosha, about finding joy in nature, because I think this is hard. Um, but, you know, and we have to nourish ourselves and look after ourselves and nature can help us do that. I go back to, you know, where I something I said much earlier on about how much it has sustained us through the pandemic. Um, it hopefully becomes a virtuous circle that we go out and appreciate nature and love it. Then we want to take care of nature more. And then we start taking those actions which will enable nature to flourish more and and so on. Um, and the other thing I'd say is share the share the good stories. So don't be overwhelmed by, um, you know, there's a lot of dramatic headlines and we're going to keep seeing these and it is serious and it is urgent. But we can take action. We can do it one step at a time and we can do it together with other people. And together, collectively, we can make a difference. Um, so yes, go out and have a lovely walk in the fresh air after sitting in front of your screens. But thank you for listening as well. What a very positive note to end on. Right, we're just coming up on two o'clock. Um, oh, we've had one more question pop in and it's a quick one, so we will take it. It says, I think the person who registered our church has forgotten the login details. Can I re-register the church? Uh, yes, you probably have to log in yourself, go and find your church. You don't need to re-register it. You can that person can get their own login sorted out. You can go in and register, sign up yourself, go and find your church. D don't re-register it. It's, it'll still be on there. Yeah. Right, that one snuck in just before. Just before <laughs> okay. the, um, thank you so much, Helen. Thank you for, your, for sharing okay. your wisdom and, and practical understanding of how to move forward with Eco Church. Uh, thank you everyone who's joined us today. And we've got those two more topics coming up on Eco Church. So one on gaining an award and gathering momentum and one on net zero carbon. Those are coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, this afternoon, I'll send you round the slides and the links from the chat. And I'll make sure that the links through to those other webinars are in that email. So that if you've left today thinking you want the next chapter, that you can book onto that and come along to those as well. Uh, I'm going to just save the chat before we finish and then bring us to a close. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye.